Well, we are back into our series. We started the series at Thanksgiving time, and we've been moving through talking about the fabulous life of Elijah. And we've transitioned because we know that the ministry and the work of the great prophet Elijah continued on through John the Baptist. But last weekend, we had a message scheduled, and and it got diverted because we decided we needed to talk about tragedy. And in wake of the things that happened in Connecticut, we decided we needed to to help process that and and move through that, that time and figure out just how to think about it, the things that we could do. But interestingly enough, that particular message for last weekend was planned and was coordinated because of some things that were happening in our world. And uh, I'm glad to see that you are all here because I I realized that it was a close call. You know, and I know how that feels. In fact, yesterday I was driving with my son, Mike, and we were driving down the road and he was driving and and uh, all of a sudden, this, this little tiny deer, not more than a yearling, ran, darted right out in front of the car. He slammed on the brakes, did a great job of avoiding this little animal, but both of our hearts were pounding. You know, that's what happens when you have a, a close call or a near miss, right? And so I'm, I'm just looking, trying to figure out, you know, are, are, you guy, are your hearts racing with this near miss? You know, the world almost came to an end. Or you got, you, but you seem pretty chill about the whole thing. Maybe you didn't know, right? We, the Mayan calendar, right? We've got the Mayan calendar. And that looks very authoritative, doesn't it? It means carved in stone after all. Of course, the Mayans had four calendars, and this one didn't, didn't really predict the end of the world. It predicted the end of a cycle on 12 21, 12 But we had the Mayan calendar, but there were some folks who, who took that to mean that we'd have real calamity, like a, a meteor striking the earth. That would be bad, Right? Or even this other picture from one of the movies that depicted all of this. That's the Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, it's being toppled by a massive earthquake and tidal wave combination. That would be bad, right? But none of that happened. And so this morning, I want to share with you some things that we can learn. Four poignant points. And I don't know what got into me, but all of them have the alliteration of P. You're going to be sick of that, but maybe it'll help you memorize it. Remember what we've talked about. Four poignant points for this morning. And the first point that I think is fairly obvious is that predictions are pointless. Predictions are pointless because nobody knows. Now, why do I say nobody knows? You know, is that just the demonstration of the limit of my knowledge and the beginning of my ignorance? No. Nobody knows because Jesus said nobody knows. In fact, the the key verse, the memory verse for today is from Matthew 24. And let's not read the bracketed part, but let's read the verse together. No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels of heaven, or the Son, Nobody knows but the Father. Now, maybe, maybe, you know, some people in their minds say that Jesus is really, what he really means to say is, nobody knows, but oops, we slipped it to the Mayans. Yeah, they do know. Of course not. You know, nobody knows except that, that author who, who's done his numerology, and, and he knows, but he's the only one, right? Nonsense. The very same Savior who professes himself to be the Son of the living God, the very same Jesus who declares he was there at the moment of creation, the same Jesus who predicts that he will be crucified, he will be put to death and rise again from the grave, and that same Jesus who said that he died to forgive our sins. His word is our foundation and our hope, and that Jesus says nobody knows. So you know what I believe? Take a wild guess. Say it out low. Nobody knows. In fact, when I I hear someone predicting a specific date, my first reaction, and I know this isn't necessarily theologically accurate or faithful or anything else, but my fleshly reaction is, well, obviously it's not that day. 
Point number one, predictions are pointless because Jesus said so. But point number two follows closely on the heels because when we see these dates come and go, when we see these predictions and all of the justification for the predictions and they come and they go, there's a temptation to begin to think, ah, you know what, that's just baloney. All of that world-ending stuff, that's never going to end. It's just going to go on and on and on and on like it seems to have gone on and on and on and on from the beginning. That's a mistake. Because point number two is this planet is passing away. It is. There will be an end. The Bible predicts it. Jesus predicted it. And the message of John the Baptist on the heels of of other prophets, John the Baptist is predicting that the time is near. In fact, that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. There will be an end. And and while it it doesn't necessarily look anything like the pictures or the, the movie theaters depict it, there is a time when this world will end as we know it, where Jesus will return in the clouds, and he will bring with him all who are already dead. And whether or not you and I are there to witness that, the other reality that we need to come to grips with is while this planet is passing away, whether or not you and I live to see that day, or whether we return with the Lord in those clouds, we are passing away. There is a time coming when the world, when life ends for us. Where this planet ceases to exist for us. You know, we we were shocked and appalled when, when that happened for 20 little kids last weekend. But it happens every day. While that is tragic, there are people dying every day. Over the course of this Christmas season, there are likely to be loved ones and friends and family in a group of people seven plus thousand strong. You know that there are going to be someone in our association, our family, our friends that loses their lives. That brings me to point number three. Preparation is prudent. You know what I mean by prudent, right? It's wise. It's the wise thing to do. We need to be prepared. Whether we are preparing for that last day when all of us will will be gathered up with the Lord, or whether we are preparing for that last day when we take our last breath and our heart stops beating, we need to be prepared. That's what John was getting at. Matthew 3 goes on, This was the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. The people were responding to the message of John as he spoke by the Holy Spirit and said, prepare, repent, be baptized. But it wasn't just John who called for that preparation. It was Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Jesus said, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe. That's what our preparation is all about. Now, This idea of repent, let's let's talk about that. Because this word repent, you know, the idea of of a preacher calling out repent, it's almost become cliche in our world. You know, the the culture has made it almost a a, a sort of a, a joke. But dear friends, the word, the call to repentance is no joke. That's the words of our Savior, repent and believe. This idea of repentance, what does it mean? Well, maybe the best way to describe repentance is by using a couple of diagrams. The first one is this arrow. 
And you know, think about this arrow as representing our lives and our direction and our goals and our, our dreams and the things we want to do and the things we want to accomplish and the places we want to see. It represents our lives. And, and when we have our lives on track, we are moving toward those goals and those dreams. While there may be little sidetracks and little things that move us off center, the goal is that we just keep on moving. The problem is that the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. You see, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, all the way back to the beginning, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, when they decided they wanted to be gods themselves, when they wanted to rule their own little universe, that rebellion tainted all of us. And so every one of us lives with that original sin. Every one of us lives with that, that error, not just as something we do, it's a part of us. So when we are following our own direction, our own dreams, our own goals, when we're doing all of the things that seem right to us, that's what God is saying. When you're being God of your own little universe and following your own direction, it's leading you somewhere. It's leading you to death and disaster. And yet we all get caught up in it, don't we? We all get caught up in this idea of setting our goals and living our life and dreaming our dreams and, and living life in a certain way. And what repentance is, is a 180 degree turn. In fact, if we use the same idea of diagram, it's that U-turn. When we're moving along that path and we're, our nose is to the grindstone and we've got our dreams in sight, we're doing all the things that seem right to us, when all of a sudden something, something breaks through. Whether it's a, a sermon or a song or the witness of a friend, maybe it's a, a disaster or something else that, that shakes us to our core, and all of a sudden we realize that what we've been chasing after, what we've been moving for is the wrong thing. Repentance is in the, in the recognition of that wrong thing. We turn back and we say, God, I, I'm, I'm all wrong here. Forgive me. Do you know that every single time, every single time someone in faith turns to our God and says, I've been wrong, forgive me, do you know that you and I, with 100% accuracy, can predict the answer? God's answer is yes. I forgive you. I've just been waiting for you to come back. But, but let's be clear, because this idea of repentance doesn't just begin and end there. We, we get turned around and we turn back to our God. We're in that opposite direction and we say, God, forgive me. And God's answer is yes. But repentance goes one step further. Repentance then also includes that prayer, that longing for God by his spirit to, to change our hearts and change our minds and lead us on the right path. Now, you know, maybe, maybe you're saying, well, what? Why, why, why do we have to do it God's way? You know, why do we have to follow his path? Why can't we do what we want to do? Why can't he just bless us in the things that we want to do and, and, and let us live out our dreams and do the stuff that, that seems like so much fun? Well, here's the deal. God is the one who created us. God is the one who knows you infinitely better than you know yourself. He's the one who knows the things that will bring fulfillment. He's the one who knows what will bring joy. He knows. He's not confused by the world. He's not confused by that old sinful self. He's not deceived by any of the junk and propaganda around us. He knows with crystal clarity who you are and what's going to bring fulfillment and joy to your life. And so when he says, don't keep going in that direction, it's not to take your fun away. It should get you off that path that leads to disaster. You know, when I think about that, I think about, boy, this is ancient history. Way back, I think I was maybe 14 years old. And we were living in northern Michigan. And we were on a, a small farm, and out in front of the farm was this big field. 
And we lived in a town, outside of a town called Onaway. And, and every, every once in a while, we'd have a winter where we would just get buried by snow. And this one particular winter, we were buried by snow. And so my uncle finally convinced my dad that we needed to have a snowmobile. And we actually did use the snowmobile to drive to the end of the road where, where the, my, you know, the family that was, was out from the snow, they could bring groceries and things like that. It, it actually did get used for that sometimes, but more often than not, the snowmobile was used for fun. And I remember the very first day that we had this snowmobile, it was a snow jet. Does anybody even ever, ever even heard of a snow jet snowmobile? Okay, this one was blue. It was beautiful. It was fast, although, you know, I found out there were others that were lots faster before long, but it seemed like it was really fast to me. And I remember that my dad went out in the front field and made this huge oval in the front field, and it was a blast, you know. And, and so I got to ride it, you know, after Dad made this, and I was flying around the corners and I having all this great fun. And then it was my sister Pat's turn. Pat is a year younger than me, but she was never as good a driver, quite honestly. <laughs> And so my dad was on the back of the snowmobile with her. And everything seemed to be going fine. They took off, and they went around this corner, and they came around, and they were flying down the straightaway. And as they were coming into the corner, my sister froze up. And she had her hand in a death grip on the throttle. And of course, after you left the little embankment for the turn, it was probably 20 or 30 yards until you hit the the electric fence around the front field. And so my, my dad, as a last desperate effort, because he couldn't pry her fingers loose, grabbed her and pulled her off the, the snowmobile, and this brand new snowmobile went crashing into the barbed wire, it shattered the windshield, broke some other pieces, but my sister was saved. Do you understand? When you and I are crashing, careening, flying down that path at breakneck speed, pursuing what we want, we don't realize that we are in mortal danger. It leads to death. And God will do anything, break through in any way he has to, to get us off that path and turn back to life. That's repentance. Now remember, Jesus said, repent and believe. And that word believe is, is intimately connected. It, it means the same thing as trust, right? And maybe the verse that sums it up most clearly in my heart and mind is that verse we spoke about last weekend from Proverbs chapter 3. If you know it, say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him when it says acknowledge him that means acknowledge him that means trust him that means follow him that means to be devoted to him it means love him serve him in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight not in the wrong direction in the exactly perfect direction for you because remember in Ephesians 2 verse 10 do you remember what the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write, you are God's masterpiece. You're not just a, a clump of flesh and bones. You're not just a cosmic accident. You are God's masterpiece. And you're not just a masterpiece created to look at. You are a masterpiece that Ephesians 2.10 says, God has prepared a whole lifetime of masterpiece living for you. That's what he wants for your life. Not to steal your fun. He wants to drag you off that path that leads to death and get you on a path that leads to hope and that leads to life. That brings me to, to step number four. Because step number four takes us to that place where in the midst of all of this, you know, in realizing that predictions are pointless, in dealing with the reality, though, that this planet is passing away, in, in having the prudence to prepare, where do we find peace? Dear friends, that's, 
That's what our God offers. He invites us to partake of perfect peace. You know, last week after the message, and you know a part of the message was, was how do we talk to our kids about tragic things. And one of the teachers on staff here sent out a note reminding us uh, of something that I'd actually seen a long time ago but had long forgotten. How many of you remember Mr. Rogers? How could you forget him? I mean, he had that awesome train set, right? And all those cool sweaters. I think Pastor Zach inherited every one of them. Probably going to pay for that later. (laughs) But, Mr. Rogers, in one episode that I remember when my kids were little, was talking about how do you talk to, what do you do when there is a, a calamity, when there is a crisis, when there is a tragedy. And one of the things that was so simple but so profound, they said, as our, as our kids are seeing something happening that's frightening or, or makes them nervous or afraid, that we need to lend to them a perspective and invite them in the midst of all of that to look and see all of the helpers that God puts in the middle of that. So it could be policemen, could be firefighters, could be paramedics, could be pastors, teachers, coaches, could be parents or grandparents. But you see, the beauty of that is that when our kids are being overwhelmed or afraid of what's happening around them, we change their focus and we get them off what's terrifying and we help them to see that God in his love has placed people who can help right there in the middle of the worst circumstances. Beautiful, isn't it? But dear friends, it applies to us as well. Perfect peace is not about living in a world where everything goes right. It's not about living in a world that's not going to come to an end. It's not about living a life where our lungs stop breathing and our hearts stop beating. It's not about living a life where all of our problems disappear, where everything is like a a love song on the radio. It's about living in the midst of a world where there's all kinds of pain and all kinds of struggle. The reality is that our focus isn't on all of that. Our focus is on our God who loves us. You know, a verse that is ultimately a Christmas verse, but we don't don't often cite it, is John 3.16, right? Say it with me. For God so... that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved the world. God so loved you and me. He loved us so much he sent his son so that you and I would not perish. We'll have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes on and clarifies even further. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He's not Zeus sitting on a a throne with a lightning bolt. He's not waiting for us to step out of line so he can torture us in eternity. God so loved the world that he sent his son not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be redeemed, saved. You realize that we can have that peace Not because everything's okay. Because God has us in his care. You know, that reminds me this past week was finals week for for many of our high school students. I think college students had it the week before, but finals week for high school students. And, you know, my my daughter Kate was was preparing for a final, and she was was really concerned about it. And thought there was going to be a really, really tough exam. And she's really serious. She wants to, to get really good grades. And she works hard. And she studies. And, and she lets me review with her. And we were doing all of the things we could. But she had heard that this test was going to be brutal. And that maybe there was stuff on the test that hadn't been covered in the class. And they hadn't gone over in the book. And so she was really nervous about it. And so the day before the exam, when they had one of the preparation days, she was talking to the teacher. And she was saying, you know... Is there anything else that I should be studying? Is there anything else that I should be doing to prepare for this exam? And the teacher was perceptive enough to realize that she was really anxious, really dealing with a lot of anxiety. And so he said, Catherine, come here. 
And he brought her over to stand next to him at his desk. And then he opened his grade book and he began to go down the grades. And he started tallying up all of the points that she had. And when he got to the bottom of the, of the, of the list, he said, okay, do you realize what this means? And she said, no, but I still have the final, and, and the final could blow the whole thing. I've got to do well in this final. And he said, Catherine, what this means is you could get a 40 on the exam and still have an A. You know, I have been trying and trying to convince her you know, to not be stressed about it, to not worry about it, to not carry all of this around. But that one authoritative word gave her peace. Dear friends, the authoritative word for your life and my life is that God has so loved us that we will not perish because we belong to Jesus. You know, I brought you one more picture. I know you've seen this before. It's that, uh, that beautiful scene with the trees and the color and the mountains in the background and that water in front. You know, and I love these reflective pictures because the water has to be peaceful for them to work. What's, what's interesting about this picture is I don't think I've ever told you what's going on around it. To start with, you need to realize that the water that I'm taking this picture over is probably not much wider than this altar. It's not some big lake. It's just a, a little bitty pond. And, and off to the side, off over on this side, about a mile away is a huge construction site. They're doing all kinds of construction on this ski resort, and it is loud, and there's big equipment, and there's that beep, beep, beep. You can hear it loud and clear. Over, if you're over my shoulder where you are in relationship to the picture, there's a really busy road, and there are snow plows going back and forth on this road, and it's loud. And off to my right, down over here, there's a little stream that trickles along, and I know that sounds idyllic and peaceful, but there's this whole group of people splashing around making all kinds of hullabaloo over there. This is not a peaceful scene. But that one place... That picture, in the midst of all of that chaos, it's peaceful. Dear brothers and sisters, do you realize that's what Jesus offers? Not a peace because our world is peaceful. Not a peace because our bodies are without flaw. Not a peace because the, the world is not going to end or our economy is in perfect condition or our families or our wives or our husbands or our relationships are all together. It's not a peace because everything's good. It's a peace that passes human understanding. It's a peace that comes because we know that the Savior of the world, the God who created this world, and His Spirit are with us and promise they will never leave us because we belong to them. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we head full steam into Christmas, we know that there are going to be lots of situations that aren't peaceful. It may be conversations, it may be parking spots, it may be food, it may be health, it may be, oh Lord, it could be any of a million things. And there's going to be that temptation to give up that peace that passes understanding. Lord, by your Spirit, speak to our hearts and our minds. Draw us back to yourself so that we can be like that still, quiet water. That we will hear your voice loud and clear that we will experience your peace that passes understanding. Lord, we pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Now, as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out that message of life. Amen. Mm -hmm.